Welcome back to The Bridge with Kira. Uh, this is the second hour. It's about 5 p.m. Eastern Time, the 4th of March, 2017. Bonnie? Hello. Philip, you're on the air. It's uh, The Bridge with Kira. Welcome. Bonnie, bonjour. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I got you here. I got, uh, luckily, it's working. I'm, I got my daughter's last basketball game and she, she's up in the mountains and this crazy storm going on and snowing and hail and rain wow but i'm here and i'm glad to make it with your relatives and thank you for uh, having me on thank you so much for joining me um uh, i do i was thinking that we could um tell each other some stories for a little bit but i also wanted to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself in whatever way you're comfortable introducing yourself um yeah you know uh, my name is not important i guess but the message kind of is maybe um but my name is uh, Philip Mishike. Uh, Mishike is a little mud turtle. I uh, come from Little Traverse Bay in northern Michigan. Uh, little Traverse Bay, bands of Odawa, uh, in the Shinobi, Nation. And uh, that's on my grandma's side, my father's side. And then my my father's um, father is from Ganawage, uh Mohawk Res, up near, near Montreal, and uh, the Canadian side. And then my mother is from upstate New York, and uh, she's, she's an Irish, Irish lady. So I'm one of those mixed, mixed relatives. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just, um, I come from a mixed background and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up. Um, I always, always had traditions in the communities and, uh, um, available to me, but I grew up kind of fast on the streets. Um, early, at an early age, you know, my mother, she, um, my mother and father don't work out and he goes where he goes. And, um, what happens a lot in Indian communities, these broken homes. Mm. And, uh, my mom kind of, you know, she, uh, she wasn't able to take care of me and my two brothers, and so my two brothers went into family, and, and somehow I went into foster care, mm. which was a blessing in the skies because in the long run, I think it was meant to be uh, to help shape who I am today. Um, uh, but all in all, I guess I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly, you know, more importantly than anything, I'm a father. Um, these other things I do, like poetry and, and speaking and storytelling and performing, these are all secondary things. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I, I was a... Uh, an activist at one point. I don't really consider myself an activist at this point, more of like a uh, artivist. Mm. Uh, I, tried to, I tried to focus my, um, you know, these angers and these sadnesses and these joys and all these things, these emotions that come up um, in Indian country, I tried to refocus them into my art, which would be poetry, you know, and, and um, different pe- performing, you know, performing live and different things. Um, but I guess to circle back, though, um, you know, early on growing up, like I said, I was in and out of foster homes and institutions, juvenile hall and acting out and uh, disrespecting everything and not really knowing any better. But um, eventually I had my first daughter 13 years ago and uh, it was kind of like um, straightened me right up, you know, kind of uh, showed me what, what, what I was doing and what I wasn't doing really strongly. And my ancestor came to me and grabbed me by my ear. And for 13 years, I've been on this, uh, what you call the red road. Mm. And just, you know, so I, I went from, you know, making negative gangster rap music. I was part of a kind of a music scene in the Bay Area, a kind of a famous Bay Area uh, rap scene. Um, and, I, you know, I had to leave all that when I decided to sober up. Yeah, I had to cut all those ties to all the people from the streets. You know, I loved all those people. I had to uh, isolate myself. And uh, me and my wife at the time, we moved up north from the Bay Area to a place called Mendocino County. Mm. And we got up there to, you know, to the woods. And uh, it was the isolation I needed, you know. It, it wasn't so easy to go get caught partying and get the phone call at 2 in the morning to come out, you know, when you're living a couple hours away from everyone. So, uh, you know, it just disappeared. And, and I, you know, I, I reconnected to my my family back home and two different Indian people that help uh, that uh, I grew up with out here because, you know, growing up and being born in, in the Bay Area, um, you know, I'm not around a lot of Anishinaabe people or, or my people. And so... You know, I go back and forth as a child to visit, and that's one thing. But um, feeling really lonely out in California. But luckily, these California people, this tribe up here in Sonoma and Mendocino County, uh, the Pomo people, uh, really kind of adopted me and took me in and took care of me. And um, you know, I went to their ceremonies a lot growing up, and to their roundhouses and their big times, and um, doctored by their elders and, and their teachings. And 
still connected to Anishinaabe ways, of course, but uh, very much adopted these ways uh, uh, here in California, our beautiful ways. Um, so to make a long story short, <laughs> a short story really long, <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> I just my life has been chaos. You know, it's, it's, it's been a life full of building things, and then, uh, then it's like almost purposely destructing them. So years go by on this red road. I'm doing really doing really well, and, you know, I'm, I'm helping youth out, and I'm part of a, a, a Snag Magazine youth group, which is the 7th Native American generation based out of San Francisco in the Mission District. A friend and cousin of mine named Ross Kadi started this um, this youth group um, a little over a decade ago. And, it's, you know, so I, I help mentor the youth and go on, and we take them on field trips and do workshops with them. And we really try to help them express their uh, their art, you know, and uh, we, we try not to censor them. So we, we come out with a periodical, uh, a magazine, which... Um, which presents their artwork, basically, their pictures they take, their poems, their music. Um, and like I said, we don't censor them, so sometimes it could be kind of rough, you know, the realities of the res, the realities of the inner city. Um, they're in a family situation. But we know that's a really important thing, and so we just try to support those youth. And through that, you know, that, net that network connects to so many other networks. And, you know, I also work up in, um, on the coast, a place called Point Arena, Manchester, Como Res. Mm -hmm. um, and it's where Ross, Ross Kitty comes from. There's another cousin there, his cousin named Isaac Rios, who has a place called the Pidaha, uh, Pidaha uh, Youth Cultural Camp, which is a traditional camp on the river. It has, you know, uh, redwood bark teepees and a fireplace, and they hold talking circles and do workshops and, you know, um, you know, make things, uh, medicine pouches, different things, different cultural things like that. And so I really kind of shied away, you know, uh, for years I was on the road just performing, performing, speaking, going all over the country doing the whole movement thing. And, you know, I, I start to slow down, and there's, and there's a real big reason behind it, you know. Uh, 2007, I'm, I'm at a place called the Ganawita Quetzalcoatl at University in Davis, California. It's a tribal college, only a off-tribal college, off-res tribal college, California. And uh, I had some friends going to school there, and the, the board was misappropriating funds. Long story short, the students decided to, to take the school over and to... Um, and to liberate the school from this crooked board that had been stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from them and, and, and the school. And so they took the school over, and, and the occupation lasted from, I think, 2006, 2005, 2006 to 2011, which might be possibly maybe the longest, you know, native occupation um, um, in history, maybe, that uh, we know yeah. of as a length of time. I mean, I lived there for years, you know, and we, we had the whole, you know, it's kind of funny because you know when you're growing up you always think when you're going to school like i mean imagine if we had this whole school to ourselves with no teachers mm -hmm. so you know I'm, I'm already 30 years old and i'm running around like a little kid that's the school <laughs> we have this whole school to ourselves you know? <laughs> we're you know we're the elders we're, we're the teachers we're everything so it was a really powerful time though but in that time period so you know the, the dq student occupation was very much connected to some of the students there you know one of my friends the jean banks peaks his uncle dennis banks and so we're very much connected to uh, AIM and the American Indian Movement, and so we're doing things with them. You know, we're not really representing ourselves as AIM, but we're we're we're, we're running with AIM, and we have our own thing going on. And and I just started to notice that some of these leaders, you know, that you know, uh, you know, uh, without trying to judge too much, you know, I got to judge them a little bit. But it, it, I started to notice they don't walk their, they, they weren't walking their talk, you know. And mm. it's like I was kind of being, I was getting kind of uh, prepped to be kind of one of those guys, one of those next American Indian movement prophet, male dominating ultimate warriors. You know? mm, not very traditional, I, is it? <laughs> well, you know, and so you know, and, and, and with that right there, it's definitely not traditional, you know. And so I'm looking at it differently now. From some time has passed, I look at it not as intensely. But when when I, when I first started to recognize, it, yeah, like this isn't traditional. All these guys. You know, they got they got 20 wives. You know, across 15 states, and 40 kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm being a little drastic, but in general, well, Dennis Banks does have like 20 everywhere. some kids. Dennis Banks has 20 some kids with nearly as many yeah, women. Yeah, you know, and there's something wrong yeah. with the, to me. There's nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, it, uh, I was a father, and you know, I and, and we, I ended up not being together with my my my, my daughter's mothers, and and um, and so that's a big issue in my life, and and, and a major lesson, and. and um, and so to watch all these great leaders people held so highly on these pedestals, uh, and uh, it, it was hard to. And I started to just, once again in my lifetime, I, I build things up and then and I destruct them. It, it kind of reminds me of like those, those Tibetan sand paintings where they make mm. these really beautiful paintings and they mess them up after. Right. Um, 
So that's kind of how I look at my life. I look at my life. It's, it's, it's never ending. It doesn't matter what I go towards. It's going to eventually pay an hour and I'm going to destruct it. And a lot of people tell me, oh, you're ruining your career. You're ruining this. But see, what I'm doing, it, it was never meant to be a career. I, you know, being a performer and, and a person that's in public eye, in the public eye, it, it's not, you know, I started out, you know, um, being said all this stuff about fame and glory and, you know, recognition. And once again, I, I started to see how unintegral these things were. And I'm looking at my own daughter. <clears throat> I'm thinking, well, you know, I can't be the next same guy. You know, I can't, you know, I can't live, a, you know, states away. I, I just couldn't see myself finishing out my life as uh, as an AIM member in, in that movement. And so um, I really started to focus and, you know, not roll with them so much. And I started to speak up and question them. And when I started to question these leaders and their followers, you know, they they were always weren't so um, so nice about it. And mm. they, um, you know, for representing their who protect any people well I, I don't you know sometimes i was getting death threats for for speaking up and so that so I, i'm wondering how that's protecting me if i'm an indian person you know? yeah the only pe- the only people <laughs> who've ever threatened my life have been aim and cops so mm. yeah i'm with you there i i um used to live in the bay area so all the places you're describing i'm very familiar with um all of them and i i did see something about you being a shell mound uh um i was there yeah, I was there briefly. I, I definitely supported the Shell Mound. Um, I had some relatives that were, you know, camped there. And, uh, you know, all the what I call the Bay Area Natives, the Bay Natives, you know, of course, they were all there and, and, and uh, ones behind that. And um, so I went down, I went there as much as I could to stay in that a few nights and saying to be on the fire and help out. And um, But once again, you know, that's kind of an aim thing, too. And so my time was kind of numbered there. Mm-hmm. I had a... I had a um, but, I, you know, I like to support, you know, people see me on social media and I have a real strong opinion about things and so I don't want people to get it twisted, you know. This, uh, I, I question things, you know. I, I'm very objective towards things and very contrary towards things. Um, it, things are never going to be good enough for me. It doesn't mean they're not good. Doesn't mean that people haven't done great things, and they don't. Their intentions are great, but I think that um, I'm never satisfied because I just want to see my people as, as happy and healthy and as protected as possible. And so I think we get really we get we get lazy when we get a few concessions here and there. And so I think that it's um. For me to question what the sad thing in any country is, is someone like me, someone like you, we get told to, 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 to get in line. We get told to quiet down. We don't know what we're talking about. And maybe we do sometimes, maybe we don't. But we, when we're questioning things, I think it's really sad that there's no place in the circle for people like people like us. Because if you don't go along with programs, you don't go along with the flow, then there's really then you're going to get pushed out of these circles. And But they're supposed to represent full circle of quality. Yeah. And so to me... Um, you know, I I can't help it. I'm going to question things. I'm going to question, it. and and I can't help it either. You know, people tell me things. The spirits tell me things. I, I see things, and uh, it's like when people do these leaders do things. Um, somehow they they get presented to me, and, uh, and you know, not that I'm supposed to fix it or anything like that, but I feel that um, there's a reason why I always find out what these. Um, I get next to these leaders, and I find out who they really are. You know, for for many years. I rolled with uh, John Trudell, who was very much a mentor of mine and like a spiritual uncle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we and we eventually part our ways um, um, due to some some things, some issues, I things I didn't understand that he was part of. Mm-hmm. Um, and no disrespect to John, you know, I really love John. I have a lot of respect for John. Um, and you know, we had a big fight. We had a big kind of a big brawl on on social media at one point, and you know, I heard a lot of people's feelings, mutual friends, and people that really followed both what we were doing and. And, you know, I thought it was um, people, of course, telling me to be quiet. You know, I'm disrespecting the great John Trudell. And, you know, I know exactly who they're talking about. I spend many nights around him talking, you know, and, and crying and laughing. And uh, But I also feel that it's important. when, I, For example, when I become his age, and if I have nephews under my wing, then I'm an ex- if I'm teaching them things and they're, they're you know, they're, they're watching my vibration and what I do, then I'm going to expect that – some youngsters under me are going to question me and turn around on me sometime and look at me with lightning in their eyes because that, to me, that's the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So, um, another thing, you know, so I, I, you know, I've had different mentors and different uncles and it kind of always ends up happening. Like that. I kind of have questioning them and then, you know, always try to get involved. And at this point, I guess you could say I'm kind of, uh, exiled in the country, kind of, you know, red listed, but that's a, you welcome know, that's, to the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I, uh, and I and I like that about you, sister. You know, um, I noticed that you uh, speak your mind. You have your own mind, and you're not afraid to to question things. And um, 
I think we need, we don't need everyone to be like us, but um, the, the ones that are like us, you know, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I, I, it's extremely sad to me and disappointing that people like us are, are not respected. You know, back in the days, people like us were respected for, for our contrary views and for our objectiveness and to point out things that people weren't looking at and to say, hey, well, we're looking behind the horse. You guys keep looking forward and we're looking over there and we see something creeping on us and we might want to um, turn our attention to that. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And yeah. So I think that, you know, and there's a lot of reasons that I don't know if we have enough time to talk about all, all these ingredients, but I'm going to say that I've been trying to find a way, me and my cousins and the small group I work with, um, you know, a bunch of these uh, potsters, you know, as we'll call them. Um, yeah, you know, I guess it's, we just keep trying to be heard, you know, and uh, we look at ourselves as nobody, you know, we, we feel that fame and recognition and, and notoriety and all these things are a poison. And um, I even, as an artist now, I'm starting to look at artists as poison because I, I go around and, and I see the way we treat artists, like they're some kind of gods or something. But no, they're, you know, that if this is their gift, then, you know, some people, everyone has their gift in the circle. And so if someone's a performer, they get up on the stage, but they're no more special than the person that's sitting in the crowd or taking the door money or cleaning up after. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing I think is a major thing in any country that needs to be looked upon is these class systems within our movements. So. Right, yeah, and th- that's one of the things I le- love about powwow singing is that everybody's looking at the um, dancer. <laughs> They're not looking at me. <laughs> that's, you yeah, know? you know. And we're down like on the too. ground with everybody. There's there's usually not a stage. Everybody is on the same level, literally, uh, in the circle. So that's what I like, and one of the things I like about um, powwow singing. And so, and we're yeah, all singing um, together, you know. Um, this is true. Too. Yeah. I'm kind of, you know, I'm not a real big powwow guy, you know. It, it, um, you know, it, being a Nishinaabe, the original word for powwow was um, Meshkikike, and it, was, it meant the medicine. Mm. And it was a gathering of medicine, and there's people um, coming together, different clans, different bands coming together to um, to come together and to, to dance together and sing together, and the people are sick. And it's kind of, you know, of course, it turned into a, you know, contest powwow, but I, I do see the essence of what you're talking about. And that's yeah. what I wanted to talk about when it came to uh, Standing Rock, too. People see me saying a lot of things about standing rock, but I'm not. I'm not against the everyday people of 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 no of no doppel. I'm against the, some of the crooked leaderships and some of the crooked groups that were part of it. Right. But right. I think it was really important that the um the uh you know I've been at these camps like a DQ and, and uh, the Shell Mounds and different different occupations where you have an inner tribal group and you're you're meeting people from across the nation, seeing across the fire, and you're building relatives. I think that's the most beautiful thing. And I think that's that's the most awesome part of the whole encampment was that intertribal uh, relationship making. Oh, um, it was amazing. I, you know, I never thought, I didn't never thought from day one that you know I didn't ever think that they were going to stop the pipeline or anything like that. Um, but I think that those things are very important. And a lot of a lot of relatives were made, and you know a lot of inspiration. You know, there's a lot of people that never been to something like that, and so I think that that's a beautiful thing too. But I can't help to see all these the, the usual uh, glory hounds that come around and take over these things with all their uh, agendas and intentions, and it's just hard because you know then they start to be treated like gods, and uh, next thing you know, it's just, uh, they control the narrative. And if anyone wants to speak up, then uh, you can't do that. And so, I personally had to not go there because I know if I would have been on the front line and I would have seen women and children or, you know, or, or the people being hurt, that I would have, I would have probably had to act up. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that was also not per, not permitted there. There's a lot of spiritual bullying going on. Yeah, and so people people that I do know from the Red Warrior camp that were there on the front lines, and when they did try to defend the people, they were spiritually bullied. I, I even know that people pulled pipes on them and told them to back up. Mm. And these are very famous, you know, these are famous Indian people. They're always on the news, always on TV, and always on the videos. And <clears throat> so I thought there was a huge contradiction. They want to be called protectors, but in reality, they were protesting. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with protesting if that's what you feel you want to do. But if you're going to call yourself a Gijita, a, a protector, well, you know, if I remember correctly, you know, just, just based upon the, the actuality of it, a protector is ready to die at any time. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that's the solution to go just go die. But mm-hmm. I'm saying if you're going to be a protector and you see people hurting your people, well, you have to put your life on the line. You have to get in between them. That might be, mean getting arrested. It might mean getting killed. Mm. And so I think there was a major danger at Standing Rock because that miscommunication between the leaderships that were at the bigger saying things and kind of were controlling the narrative. Yeah, we're protect. We want to be known as protectors, 
Yeah. Well, the police are watching this too, you know? They're, yeah. they're watching all this stuff. <laughs> and I think that the police wanted everyone to be peaceful and sit there in a, in a, uh, in a freedom of speech zone. And I think they like that. People always think that, oh, yeah, they want us to get violent. No, they don't. I mean, maybe they do. They, I don't think they really care. We can get violent. We can do nothing. They're right. going to keep doing what they do. Mm-hmm. They, they're going to keep perpetually staying at it. They're not going to slip up. But it's us who's always confused. It's always us who's not gathered together. It's always us that, you know, uh, so that's another, you know, another issue and a danger of pan-Indian movements. Right. You know, you don't have a real leadership. You have, and then you have, it's pan-Indian, so you have all these different tribal ways. You know, we have different ways. We have different protocols of how we handle situations. Yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them, a lot of them are um, similar, you know, of course, but a lot of them are different. And so, you know, I don't know if back in the day, if I think about, you know, the Lakota people, I think about like wounded knee and these things. Well, they used to, the whole purpose was the women and children would run when, when fighting would happen. And now they're, they were purposely bringing women and children to the front line. Yeah. And, and, and to me, that's just disrespectful to our warrior culture. That's disrespectful to those, those people. It puts them in danger. And so that's another thing. So let's all stay peaceful and they're going to beat on us, but let's not do nothing back. And let's allow our women and children to be up front in the front line to be hit by all these projectiles. It was just crazy to me. It didn't make no sense to me. It and was so, uh, hard to hard to see. And in the other thing, what you were saying about the spiritual bullying that that's the number one complaint of the the young the actually the International Indigenous Youth Council. So most of the those um, youth that's the that is what they say is that when they when they were their bravest they got they were not appreciated for their bravery when they came back to camp mm. you know for their bravest acts like and um, and I'll use um Tashina as an example she was one of the uh I had her on on the show in August when the very first action happened and it was quite uh, it, it was an action that was just in the moment and it was five Lakota women that jumped the fence and ran um ran across the 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 area where they were working and shut that construction down for the day they ran across yeah, there and then, that video that, well that, that, that video the video you right saw <laughs> the video you saw was all the people who were inspired by them who ran after oh, them oh they came afterwards right yeah yeah so but it took those those first five women to do it and when and they swam across the river to get back to camp and not get arrested wow and when they got back to camp, they were not, you know, welcomed by, uh, by the elders who, like you say, were, you know, spiritually bullying and saying, you know, we, we didn't approve of that. And so there was this whole inner, inner conflict of, well, those aren't my elders. And, and there, there we back right. to the pan Indian yeah. thing, you know, and that, that's the <laughs> problem. The anyway, we got to respect every elder. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, if, but, you know, I've had plenty of people that are called elders tell me to do something, and it would go against what my own elders would tell me not to do. So, right. And then, you know, that's another thing, too, you know, in a pan way, we're supposed to respect every elder we come across. And there's all, you know, but where do we get all these ideas, you know? It's, um, I, and I think respect's a great thing in any culture. I think all cultures have that. But I think that this pan-Indian thing is, uh, is, is, is out of control. And so I think from the start, you know, people want to agree with me. But, see, something like Standing Rock was written from the beginning to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a national movement. And so I think... What, what, what's the point behind these national movements that are written that, that the intelligence agencies are part of? Mm. Um, to me, you know, there's a lot of things they're doing. They don't ever just do one thing. But one of the main things is, okay, you you have these small groups in Red Warrior Camp, these, these grassroots every day on the front lines in their home communities, kicking and screaming everywhere they go, been steadily at it. And, and they're, they're marginalized and they're never heard from that much and they're never helped. They never get droves of people and donations, but so they go to Standing Rock to fall in the line because they know that if they don't go there, that no one's going to come help their movement. So they go over to Standing Rock and, uh, you know, they, they, they go to, they go to Standing Rock and, and I think the main thing behind it, the main objective behind all these weekend warriors is, is to make all the people that go there, the weekend warriors, to make it look, these are the renegades. These are the native resistance. It's to further isolate, to further marginalize, and to further uh, make ghosts of the true Ogijida that are out here. Mm-hmm. And there's, so there's so few of them, there's so few in every community that now they're really unheard of. Because now, that, now, now they're just known as a no, no doppel. But see, they have their like once again, they have their own issues, they have their own territories, they have their own protocols, and they have their own stories. And I think it's sad because they need to be heard. We need to be supporting these other places, Sepulmec, and these different places, these different camps. Mm-hmm. But 
soon as the standing rock pops up, you know, it, it, it's like a vacuum. Right. And, uh, and and I, I think it's dangerous too because then people think it's some kind of victory. But you know, wait a minute, you know, the whole point was to stop the pipeline. You know, I don't see no victory. I don't see a victory when there's that many people locked up. I don't see a victory when Red Fawn's still in there. I don't see a victory when plenty of people are still coughing with that cough. I don't see a victory when our people are highly traumatized from what happened. Yeah. People, and I don't know. If people, I think people are starting to understand the effect the post-traumatic stress has. I know in the occupations I was part of, and the few times that we had the run-ins with the police, it definitely affects you. Mm-hmm. And so they were they were being affected for months on end. And so I I don't know if they even know how affected they are. Oh yeah. And oh, so, definitely they do. <laughs> definitely. You know, and then you got to think about too. You know, I'm just thinking about because you know I know ceremonies. You know, and so when we have ceremonies and we have events, we expect enemies to come we expect dark spirits to come and to try to stop what we're doing mm-hmm. so a place like you know Ocheti is uh you know how, how how many dark spirits came in there how many people came in there and were disrupting things so it's like how could you ever really have any focus or togetherness when it was that free for everyone in the world to come and bring in their energy mm-hmm. so i think it was a great symbolic movement now a great symbolic stand but i'm going to leave it at symbolic and now to me symbolic is great to talk about it's great to look back upon but it doesn't change nothing mm. it, it rarely ever ever changes anything and so i think that um yeah i don't you know so we can have 100 more symbolic movements but if you know if our people are still in the state we're in and our communities are still in poverty and we're still being um you know we're not being treated like sovereign nations then what's the point you know I think that's, uh, I think America's built upon that, you know, the, the hoorah, we did it, you know, the, like George Bush on aircraft carrier, you know, <laughs> yeah. won, you know, but mission success. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what we really won cousins because <laughs> once again, um, that's one pipeline out of, you know, what is there? Six million miles of pipeline in, in North America, mm, Yeah, six million miles of pipeline already there. So to me, it's like, okay, I have, I have a, I have a, I have an artery open and, but everyone's telling me to, to, to fix this topical cut I have in my hand. Mm. And as a people, we have an artery open. And so it's like, well, we're going to, if we, if we really want to, you know, if water is really life and, 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 and we don't want oil, then maybe we should find a way to get off oil. And I don't think it can happen overnight. And so I don't expect people just to, it would be nice, you know, imagine, imagine a week of every native person and every Mexican person in, in North America didn't buy anything for a week and then go to work for a week. Imagine what that could do. Imagine if all of us, that's just one thing. Or if we all that... unplugged and started growing our own food and getting off the grid, you know, because there is no this sovereignty is without tea and energy sovereignty. And, and, you know, people freeze to death every year on the reservation because the power companies shut their shit off. Um, why aren't tribes, I've been saying this for 20 years, why aren't the tribes creating their own power infrastructures with, um, you know, with whatever money, I think that's the well. I think it's another issue here is the BIA. And so we have these mm-hmm. Bureau of Indian Affairs leaders. That another thing that Standing Rock and No Devil did was somehow try to make BIA cool or accept or like if they're with us or they're any kind of ally, which they've never been an ally. And they've always been an enemy and always been the four Indians. Too. They've always been the spies. They've always been the assassins. They have always been the other side, the four Indian. And so I think that's another another psychology that. You know, these, these intelligence agencies are working on the people through this. If you hear some noise, I, I'm in the car with a bunch of my nieces and family, so. Okay, no you know, problem. Just, just regular everyday Indian noises, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, it's not But no yeah, problem. I think, I think that's, that's a major thing, though, is, uh, is, is to make the, the true grassroots people disappear into this bigger movement so they're never heard from again. And then you have, also, to, to psychologically make Indian people think, oh, the BIA, that's, these are our chiefs, these are our government, this is our tribe. Well, maybe sick too is seeing that flag row there. That whole flag row, those aren't who we are. Those are all the government Indian flags of ours. Basically, those are all of our white flags. And so, once again, that was part of psychology to make the BIA and our tribal governments look as if they're with us. And they allow them to be with us. And so I think that's that's really dangerous. Anyone that's been grassroots and been uh, resisting and been in the movements and been on front lines knows that we, it's just really simple. We can't trust them. We never can trust them. And if we can trust them, 
I mean, I, I mean, were people really that surprised that Dapple Dave turned on them? I mean, he turned from the, he was turned from the beginning. Right. No. Yeah. You know, like yeah. people that are, are we really that naive? I guess we are because I think we're that we're that could, desperate for some hope <laughs> that yes, that please. Well, that's why I said not to be too hard. Yeah. So I think I think about that too. You know, I don't want to be too hard on the people since we don't. Majority of our people, you know, are, are very asleep and. So I also don't want to shoot them down when they're trying, but my, my, you know, my, my energy is, and my issue is more with, it's never with the everyday people. It's with the, the leadership who claim to be so conscious and know it all. Because if, if you guys know it all and you know what we're supposed to be doing, well, then you guys can't be caught slipping at the bar drinking. You can't be caught womanizing. You can't be caught taking uh, um, funding from the Tide Foundation. Come on, guys. Or, or guys like me are going to call you out. Luckily for them, no one cares that I call them out. Right, right. I've been trying to call out. I've been, you know, I really like um, Tom Goldtooth. I've hang around him a few times. He's a good guy. He's a funny guy. <clears throat> but you know, when I seen that they were funded by the Tide Foundation, wait a minute, guys! Like you guys have never told the people why or how that happened. Mm-hmm. And when I go to question them, they just ignore me. Yeah, yeah. And and then and none of their people, none of their fans or followers, when I go into their social media and question this. They all act like I'm not saying it. And I know what their answer is going to be, like the rest of my relatives who get grants. And I'm not against grants. I'm not against funding. But at this point, I'm starting to be because they're going to say, well, you know, we got to get the money somehow, and we might as well liberate it from the enemy and use it for our benefit. But wait a minute, guys. You think the enemy is that stupid? You think the enemy doesn't think, okay, we're going to fund these, these groups. It's a part of their plan. It has to do with energy, a transfer, a trans, transferring of energy. Right. So we take their money, and we and we and we get hundred thousand dollars from this big foundation, from these elitists, and we use that in our communities. Okay, great. But once again, who are we working for? If whoever hands you money is who you work for, so we are working for these these huge NGO, you know, these nonprofit, um, these foundations that are all crooked. If you look into them, they're just all crooked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so to me. That's another I call it another thing that they've um, um, they've inspired us to head towards a different road. Is that how we're going to save everything? Is we're going to peacefully protest? We're going to come together as Pan Indians? We're going to call the White House? We're going to sign petitions? We're going to protest and hold signs and scream at the police? We're going to you know, great you know, but I still don't see how that's taking responsibility as Indian people, and I don't care what tribe you come from, because. If one, like you said, if we're not growing our own food, if, if our languages aren't being reemerged, if we're not growing our own food, how are we truly sovereign? Even if we did all those things, I think the government would, would still not allow us to be sovereign. But at least we could say well, we're, we're without them, we're um, we're okay. Right. And, but I yeah. don't see that because you, you, you know, here in California, like the, or my relatives up here, the uh, Yurok people in Karuk, and, you know, like all reservations are having a huge suicide Mm-hmm. Um, issues going on with their youth. And, <clears throat> well, what do they do? They get a grant from the government and they bring in a bunch of specialists. Well, these people don't know. The only thing they know about, they don't know nothing about what's going on with Indian people while they're taking their lives. Right. And so, you know, it's it's all this exclusive. Um, and in, let me put it this way. In an Indian way, traditionally, for my people anyway, mental illness or addiction or anything like that would be looked upon as a community issue. It would never be an exclusive um, it's that person's fault, their choice. Right. It would be actually would fall, the responsibility would fall on their family and their community. Mm-hmm. But they can't have us doing that, you see, because if we did that, then we would leave no one behind. If we did that, we would look at our own selves and our own lives. <laughs> we start pointing our fingers at everyone that's, that we, we seemingly think is lower than us. Well, right. Right. If, it, if, we, if it was our fault too, then maybe, you know, of course we wouldn't do that. And so, yeah. I, I don't. Let's just put it this way, sister. I don't have a lot of hope. I'm very jaded towards humanity. I'm very jaded towards Indian people and movement. I have no. Um, I have no hope for 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 human beings at this point. Maybe in individuals, you know, but um, I don't have hope for for humanity to do anything. Um, it's debatable whether these prophecies are are here now or not. I know they are here now. I think that when it comes to my people's prophecies, and we have many. The most famous one being the seven fires. Thing, we would come to a crossroads. A lot of my people think we're at that crossroads. 
But I think we came to that crossroads in uh, my great grandparents' generation. I think that they didn't handle it, and I think we're all going to have to pay now, and I think we are paying. So people say, well, you know, Mashike, that's kind of a grim outlook. And I say, well, you know, <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, but, I, but I also remind people that the beginning is there. It's not the end. It's just a, the end of this uh, way of life, non-way of life is coming to an end. Uh, how much longer can we rape Mother Earth? Uh, how much longer can we rape each other and uh, keep going? I don't think much longer. And so I think that uh, we're right there at that brink. And I think it's um, the people who survive in these times, when it really, really, really goes down here soon, I mean, the people that go back to the earth and know how to go to the bush. They're not going to sit in the cities and fight. To, you know, There's going to be big fights everywhere. I'm going to grab my, my family and my daughters. I'm heading into the mountains. And I'm going to escape and I'm going to hide. And all let right. them all fight it out because cause this ain't my fight. You know, this ain't, I mean, people say this ain't my, my, my president. Well, this ain't my country. And I'll remind people, I'll remind people before and present, this ain't my country. So this ain't not my problem. I think Indian people have fought long enough. Um, we lead in all military enlistment. So Indian people, we've been fighting America's war for how many wars? And we die, and just like the rest of our soldiers, and don't get treated well, yada, yada, yada. And I think that time's come to an end. I, you know, I'm one of those guys, I can't, I can't stand seeing the American flag at any of our events. I, the, and when the veterans come in, I turn my back. Hmm. Mm. My ancestors didn't die, so my so 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 these freaking people can sit there and wear their flag. My grand, you know, my great, you know, my grandma didn't go to the boarding school and and get molested and beaten. So 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 I could go around and represent the very institutions and energies that did that to her. And so then I think about well, maybe the people just it's Stockholm syndrome, and I know it is. So people just want things to stay the same, and and the but, same uh, with the Christianity. I mean. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get me started. <laughs> yeah. And even deeper in the Christianity, it's all the devil worship. So I'll hang all the Christian any day of the week versus a devil worshiper. Yeah. I think, they're both, I think they're both ridiculous and ignorant and are disconnected from the earth. But I think that, I think that, you know, there's so many natives that are Christians and there's natives who, um, who represent both. Mm-hmm. And, I think that's extremely dangerous too. I think it's fence writing on a spiritual sense. And I think if you want to be Christian, you should be Christian. That's fine. If you want to be traditional, you should be traditional. But if you mix them, they conflict with each other. And so no matter how, you know, dialed in we think we are, the energies of them conflict. And so I think a lot of Christians don't understand too that, that their, maybe their religions were written and created by these um, occultists. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty vague word to use. Yeah, occultist. I know. I'm, I think people know what I mean. Um, people mistake us native people as being pagan, but see, I, I disagree. I think in a, you know, I guess we could be considered pagans because Christians would consider anyone that's not them a pagan. Right. But when I look at the pagans that came to this country, well, we looked at a lot of the things they were doing as dark medicine. And I could go on for days about that, but so to me. We can't even get to the real sources, which is all this occult devil worship stuff, because the Christians are, you know, they think they're going, they think they're fighting against them, but they're with them. <laughs> it's just the other side. It's just, it's just the Christian yeah. backwards medicine, right? Well, well I, I wouldn't call it backwards medicine because, you know, Christian uh, backwards. But, uh, it's just the other side of oh, Christianity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It comes out that, of um, Christianity. It's the Christians that believe in the devil in the first place, and you know, it's it's just. It's not separate from Christianity at all. It's very much linked and a part of and supported. It reminds by. me of maybe like they're like the first, like, like you know, Jesus and the devil were kind of like the first you know, good cop, bad cop, you know, the, the first, and then and then it came to, you know, the left wing and right wing. It's like all it's like all the same to me. They're left and right wing, um, good cop, bad cop, uh, uh, God, God worshiper, devil worshiper. These are two extremes. But where's the balance at? And I think that that's where all the other people that are left in the world with that is in the middle somewhere, being yanked to one of their sides. But see, <clears throat> so another huge issue in our community is, is the Freemasonry. A lot of people don't know that, that they're, that the majority, and, I, and I'm going to go as far as say the majority of any famous leader we see is going to be connected to the to fraternal society. Mm-hmm. Skull and, and bones. We, and when we, yeah, and so 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 what's the issue with that? We we can yell around about Freemasons and Illuminati and all this stuff we want to, but see, we have them right there in our community. So I, I don't really care what 
I, I really don't care what the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Trumps and the Bushes and the Clintons and the Warburgs and the Kissingers and all these kind of people are doing because we have them right in our community. We have these people with their agendas applying them right in our community. And so, if, you know, it's that old saying, you know, clean up your own backyard. And yeah. if we can't clean our own backyard, then what, who am I to tell America what to do? Who am I to tell the world what to do? Who am I to tell what the oil companies must do? If, if I don't like oil, then, you know, people may not believe this, but I don't drive. You know, I, I don't have a driver's license. I never have, and I probably never will. So the- I made this decision when I was a, I made this decision when I was a child. I'm riding in a car right now, so I'll admit to people I'm no better than anyone else. But I can also admit that I, that I'm addicted to oil. So we, we want to haul out about oil. First step is admitting our, our, our addiction. We're addicted to oil. Right. So, you know, I can I can sit there and go talk to the redwood trees, and they know better. Like, oh, you talk a great game, but you smell like oil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, that's where I'm at with that. I think that, um, um, not overnight, but, you know, my carbon footprint is pretty small compared to the average American. I mean, I ride in a car maybe once once a week. I ride my bike, you know, I walk. I, um, um, But, then, you know, another thing I start to think, looking at my own self, since I, I point so many fingers, is I wonder if, if there is or it could come up with what is the carbon footprint for us being on the Internet? <laughs> right. You know, because mm-hmm. I'm on the Internet all the time, and, and, uh, and it's surely uh, <laughs> people say, well, it's helping us. You know, we're communicating, and we tell ourselves all these excuses. Well, it's also just, you know, we have our own personal CIA, FBI agent right in our pocket. Mm-hmm. We do. And they're listening right do. now, so we tell them hello. You know, we don't hate them. But right. they can. They better keep trying harder because, <laughs> you know, a couple of us Indians can remember a few things, you know, about right. their powerlessness and, and the power we that we do have. So, um, well, I, I'm going to tell you something really radical that I think. Um, I think AIM was actually started by um, people who were already agents as well. Um, I agree. Oh, hey. So um, the reason I went to Standing Rock, why I felt it was safe enough to, is because they didn't, they hadn't taken over. And I never checked in with anybody. Right. You know, I didn't check in with anybody. So, except for the people who invited me um, because of that. But I saw lots of yeah. predators, lots of Bay they Area. Huh? Ames kind of lost their steam to kind of just, uh, it's kind of just panning out through the little walks they're doing and, I noticed that too, and I think it's a great thing because if you if you look through all the way back to the seventies, you know, like uh, you know, my relative Richard Oaks and John, Uncle John Trudell and mm-hmm. all these local California Indians, a bunch of nobodies, names you've never even heard of, when they took Alcatraz over, that's what happened. Ames showed up weeks, months later, and took over, and they right. saw all the cameras, and they brought all the gun, and they brought all the hype, and next thing you know, it, and they're claiming they are the ones that took Alcatraz over, and mm-hmm. and yeah, mm-hmm. it's known as, but it was the tribes of Alcatraz, all, all tribes of Alcatraz. These these were. Local Indian, mostly. right, and that's how and, every single event in Indian Country goes. Up until you know recently, um, they tried to even do it with Idle No More, and it didn't work. Well, there's so now there's new ones though. So so when you when you bring up what you brought up, I won't say as far as agents, but I'm going to say those original guys, they were all in prison together, right? They all came out together, and they all started working together. So I'm going to say it's very possible for them to be hit up in there. Mm-hmm. It's very possible. Um, I've heard a story too, you know, I don't want to gossip too much, but I heard it from a great source and I won't give all the details, but a long story short, after Wounded Knee, there was hundreds of thousands of dollars of bail money raised for, for the people. And when they were all leaving Wounded Knee, um, you know, the, the feds were picking people up, just everyday families, pulling them over, arresting them on major charges. And they were, they were rotting in jail as the leaders made off with all the bail money and they ended up going to Europe. They went to Switzerland and they went they took all the bail money, and they went and hung out in Switzerland. And now I heard this could this could be not true or not, but I heard when they were there, they were hit up by certain people there, and I told if they wanted to return back to Turtle Island, then they were going to do certain things. Mm-hmm. And I heard one of one of the relatives out of those leaderships stood up and told them to f off, and um, the rest of them went. And I heard that that other brother ended up going too because he was able to enter the country. And when they came back, you notice they all kind of got pretty famous. They all kind of went from being kind of real renegade, uh, rough, holding guns and whatever they were doing to being uh, leaders to these national movements, long walks and, you know, these different things. Yeah. So I think yeah. that, so 
So I don't know what happened. I wasn't there, but something happened in Europe. They had all the damn money. They came back to America, and they're all doing very well financially compared to how they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, something's fishy about that. Right. And so I'm, I think that, if anything, it has to do with something with their cult. It, it, it's not so much agents to start off. I don't think they were agents. Um, and I'm another, I'm another, you know, I'm another uh, sore thumb in, in, the, in the movement too because I support Anna May and her, and her mm-hmm. daughter. Yeah. And, and, and people always chalk her up, well, she was a cop, so, you know, don't listen to her, and well, whatever they can say, but this is her daughter, you know, seeking justice for her mother, and so... Yeah, and, you know, her, and like the, Denise um, is is a housewife and, and a teacher, and um, her her sister is a RCMP, and she, um, she doesn't participate at all. She's not allowed to because of her job. That's why Denise took, took it on, because she's not. Mm. And so, um, you know, and... You know, Peltier is responsible for bad jacketing, uh, Annie Mae. Uh, he's the one who bragged to her about killing the agent and her yep. and Dennis Banks, his wife at the time and in Marlon Brando's, uh, Winnebago when they again <laughs> took off and let the women get arrested. Um, yeah. Who's Marlon Brando? I think, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. yeah. And blood and um, blood out. You know, they, they don't, but they, I guess they, they, they seem and didn't think they knew that about him. But it seems like his gifts uh, were purposely they were meant to get caught with, and they did. And, and why did uh, why did why does Dennis Bank have a get out of jail free card? How is that? This is a great question. I'm uh, going to bring up something uh, that may cause some more problems for me, but I don't really care. <laughs> okay. You know, if, if you look, you know, the apple don't fall far from the tree. That old saying, yeah. And you know, I don't know where that comes from. It's probably it actually a Masonic thing, but lack of a better description. If you look at Dennis Bank's bloodline. There's a very famous man in his bloodline, if you go back generations, named Bugan Agijic, who in the day. And this man, he his dream was to marry all the all the Ogama, all the chief's daughters in his area. He ended up marrying 24 chief's daughters, <clears throat> and to have you know to have better influence in the territory of whatever dream he had. To make a long story short, he he ended up being stoned by our people, um, and it was supposedly because he was working with the Freemasonry. Mm. And and like I said, that's just a rumor, you know. But there's a whole book out there with, with information out there. I think uh, Anton Truer, I think, is the writer, an Anishinaabe writer, who has a whole book about this. But if you look, but if you think about that, you know, mm-hmm. you know so it, it comes from, you know, the, just because you come from someone doesn't mean you'll be them. But it generally, it's pretty right on, you know. Like, so he comes from someone who defected from these people and helped out these other entities and was killed for it. Wow. And so I think that um, if that's, that's never dealt with in a family, then they just keep carrying on, and I, you know, it'll just, pop back up again. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, yeah, Dennis, I was close. To, I was around Dennis a lot, you know, because I was really close to his nephew. And his nephew was a really good friend of mine. Um, but uh, I, I had to part my way many times, and uh, never wanted to. Um, he's actually the chancellor at DQ University still to this day. And if he he put his foot down, he could have stopped all the raids on us. And in 2008, when they had the Long Walk 2, AIM came to us and our occupation asked us, will you host us? We want to come to DQ, and, and when we leave from the Capitol, we want to camp there and have a kickoff from there. And we said, well, we're in the middle of an occupation. It's not the greatest time. We're running low on funds. We're running low on everything, energy. But we, just said, we, we told them yes. We felt that the reason DQ was there because they were part of the original occupation. And we felt that... We raised five thousand dollars and we got the food. We invited them in. What did they do? They came and they trashed the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, we asked Dennis to go into a sweat with all the occupiers, our, our, our leadership, and we went there to tell my problems and see if he could help us and trade for allowing them to come. You know, you did. We did something for you. You can do something for us. And we need you to speak up to this board and and no longer let them raid us because it's legal. Because we were all students there and we were all residents. Uh, they were legally raiding us and picking us up, of course, and arresting us and harassing us. And but he basically kind of just shunned that and kind of just blew it off as, "Oh, I don't, I don't have no say." And you guys are doing a good job. Keep doing what you're doing. But he then we found out that him and the leadership also knew that we we're going to be raided the week after they left. And so when when they left to go on their long walk, um, we sent a few ambassadors and we went on the walk. And a week later, we got raided, and they knew about that, and they didn't say nothing to us purposely. Um, so I'm going to say that, who, you know, <laughs> where's, where's Ames allegiance to? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It certainly wasn't to the students at DQ. It, 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 it certainly, you know, it seems like it was like, you know, I, I know they got to get permits or wherever they go, they get permits. Well, how is that, you know, I'm not even for protesting, but how is that protesting if you get a permit? <laughs> right. And now, now that AIM's sort of name is sullied and people are catching on that, that Annie Mae's true story is getting out there, um, you know, AIM's got this dark shadow. So they're reinventing themselves. They're calling themselves yep. by new names. The, the new names are Last Real Indians. Um, the new names are, you know, they, they keep going on and Chase is, um, uh, Chase is the next, uh, you know, is the next AIM leader. <laughs> so, but may, we should probably have another show because um, we're gonna we're gonna end here in like one minute. Any last thing you want to say, and we'll we'll invite you back and we'll have some more um, conversations in the future. Yeah, most definitely, sister. Um, I think we have a lot to talk about. And, um, I want to thank you again for having me on. Um, once again, I want to remind the people, you know, at uh, my name is not important, but the message is, and the message is uh, to clean our own backyards. The beginning is near. And we all know this. All we have to do is, 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 is look at our prophecies. You know, if we listen to our prophecies, you know, maybe we want to stop being prophecy and great. We want to respect these prophecies. And so I think to respect these prophecies, we don't want to just assume that we're going to win just because we try a little bit. And, um, yeah, I think it's important. Last thing I'll say, anyone listening out there, if you feel like raising up in any community and you want to say something, say it. It's worth it. Even if you get the threat, even if you get the negative energy, say it because that's what we need more of. Same old things keep happening and are never going to change until we rise up, until the women haven't. If people can hear the women rise up, then. Thank you, Philip. See you soon.